Okay, so we're ready to go. So today, we're going to be looking at uh, Hebrews 10, 28 is our verse for today. Kind of a, a challenging one. But uh, Dorothy, you're first. If you could read, please, uh, Hebrews 10, 28. Hebrews 10, 28. He that despises Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Okay. <clears throat> well, I just heard from that one there. Oh, okay. Oh, it's Paul. <laughs> Paul's. Okay, Paul's joined us on his cell phone. Is with us in person and <laughs> by the cell phone at the same time. Okay, so he that despised Moses' law. Who is he? Who was that referring to? <clears throat> Anyone. Okay, Dorothy says anyone. Any other thoughts? Yeah, my my version actually says anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy. Okay, it, many versions do say anyone, and the original word actually is not he, but it is more like anyone. Okay. However, there is a specific case mentioned in Scripture that matches that, and that is uh, Numbers fifteen twenty nine to thirty one. Uh, Evans, can you read that for us, please? Okay, you shall have one law for him that sinned through ignorance, but for him that is born among the children of Israel, and for the stranger that so net among them. But the soul, so souls that died ought presumptuously whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same approached the, the Lord and that, that soul shall be cut off from among his people because he had despised the word of, of the Lord and had broken his commandment. That soul shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, Michael, since you can't see the screen, when we come to you, uh, your verse will be 2 Samuel 12, 9. So okay. Go ahead and line that up. Okay, so that verse there, <clears throat> those verses that Evans read, is that showing two classes of sin? Yeah. Okay. Yes. One through ignorance and one presumptuously. Okay, so presumptuously means they know it's sin and you they don't do it anyway. You do it anyway. Okay. Yeah, but Defiance. You, Defiance would be another good word. Okay, good. So sinning in, in ignorance is not knowing the word of God, and the presumptuous sin is despising, knowing and despising the word of the Lord. Notice the division there is not between children of Israel versus the stranger. Okay, the same applies to both of them. The real difference, distinction is between um, sinning and ignorance and the presumptuous sin. It says um, in verse 31, Someone who hath broken his commandment. Which one? Which commandment is that referring to? <clears throat> Any commandment? Would it, would it be, thou shalt love the Lord with all your might? Well, I, I think Judy said any commandment, and I think that's right. But what you're saying, Dorothy, is true, too, because that's kind of the, the blanket commandment that covers them all. You know, if you break his Sabbath, you're not showing love toward God, of course. Yeah. However, the very next verse, so that was Numbers 15, 31, broken his commandment. The very next verse gives an example that I think absolutely fits this, um, despising Moses' law, etc. So Numbers 15, 32 to 36, Judy. Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so could he, this person that gathered sticks, could he be the person Paul was referring to if he was referring to an individual? Yeah. You mean that back verse back in Hebrews? Yes, it, it fits, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so, did he despise Moses' law, this man that gathered sticks? Yes, he broke the fourth commandment. He would surely know about the Sabbath, wouldn't he? Yeah. Um, he was an Israelite, or at least among the Israelites, so he should have known. Did he die without mercy? <clears throat> Okay, it says... I think everyone who dies, dies without mercy. Okay. Um, we're going to have some interesting discussion about this, I can see. <laughs> and um, just a, a note, and maybe for Paulette especially, who's new here, we always do these studies trying to make God look good. Okay, we know God is merciful. So we're going to explore this. Um, a couple other th other things to note. It says, they found a man. So they is plural, so there were, were at least two witnesses, right? Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. If we go back to Hebrews 10, 28, <clears throat> died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So this fits that case. Um, and it also says there, it was not declared what should be done to him. And uh, we're going to look at that more as we go to in Deuteronomy 17, 12 below, we'll come to that. But let's look at some other things that will help us to understand this. Um, King David was involved in a similar situation. So, Michael, if you could read 2 Samuel 12, 9, please. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? <clears throat> thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Okay, thank you. So King David despised the commandment of the Lord. So he would fit into this Hebrews 10, 28, he that despised Moses' law, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems he would fit into that. He despised, do not commit adultery and do not kill. Yeah, he was actually did worse I would say much worse than the man just gathering sticks. I mean, that didn't hurt the sticks, I don't think. So. Mm -hmm. um, so what David did was not an accident. He had plenty of time to think about it. And the penalty, according to the law of Moses, for what David did was what? Death. I think I heard someone say death. Probably death, yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. let's read here. And this applies specifically to his situation. Leviticus 20.10, Paul. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Okay, that sounds pretty certain. Um, Paulette, you can see your the verses list here, right? Of what yeah. You mean? Okay, good. We'll come to that in a minute. So, uh, was David put to death? No. No. Did he die without mercy? He didn't die. No. No. Rather, David acknowledged his sin. So now, Paul, at 2 Samuel 12, 13, please. And David said to Natan, I have sinned against Jehovah. And Natan said to David, Jehovah has put away your sin. You shall not die. Okay. So it seems there was mercy there. So which do you think, in a situation like this, is God's preference, a loving God, that the sinner is punished without mercy, or that the sinner acknowledges and confesses his sin? The second one. Is older the second one, yeah. Okay, I think we're all votes we're getting there for the second one. He wants us to acknowledge and confess 
the sin. And He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Yeah, we could so. we could come up to lots of verses about that. To turn mm -hmm. from your evil. <clears throat> turn from your evil. So this shows this example of David in this situation shows that it was not an irrevocable or irreversible death sentence. Okay, that didn't apply in every case. What was the death sentence meant for? And we might come with different ideas about this, but one I put down here is perhaps it was meant to bring about contrition for sin and repentance and a turning back to God who is ever merciful. That death sentence pronounced in Leviticus, you mean? Or that? Well, death sentences in general. Um, Leviticus. Well, it, it's a deterrent for sure. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Maybe that was the reason for it. It's the same as when I went to school and the, <laughs> did something bad enough, you got the strap from the principal. That was a deterrent for a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> well, death also would be the ultimate penalty. So to tell them that you would be put to death lets them know how serious mm -hmm. this is. <clears throat> Yes, um, showing the seriousness would be a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's very clear that David did repent and thus was spared the sentence. Okay, let's read Psalm 32, 5. Uh, Thomas, please. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine inequity. I said I will confess my transgression. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and who is who is saying that? I acknowledge my sin? Uh, David. That's David. David. And we have another case of that. Psalm 51, <laughs> 3. Uh, Dorothy. Uh, for I acknowledge my transgressions and <clears throat> my sin is ever before me. Okay, so those yeah. verses and there's other ones. Um, point to the certainty that if a man, if the man who was gathering sticks had repented, he would also have received forgiveness. Yep. Don't you think those point to that? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and, and even more so the following verses here, I, I should say, rather than the ones above. So let's read these Psalm 51 17, Evans. Okay, the sacrifices of God are broken, broken in spirit, <clears throat> are broken in the contrite heart. Uh, oh God, thou will not despise. Okay, so God will not despise genuine repentance, we could put it. He will honor that, he will respect it. Okay, Proverbs 28 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Okay, and Michael, sorry, I should have given you the verse. Uh, Micah 7, 18. Okay. I just have to find Micah. <clears throat> Coming up. Seven, no, yeah, 7, 18, you said? Yes. Um... Who is God? Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Okay, he delights in mercy. Um, 1 John 1 9, uh, Paul. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, good. So when Hebrews 10.28 says he died without mercy, that does not mean that mercy was not offered. Right. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. It was extended. He delights in mercy, okay? And there's other verses too. Mercy is always offered by God, or else God is not ever merciful. Right. We would have a contradiction there. <clears throat> All right. 
So I hope you agree with that. It cannot mean that mercy was not offered to him. Rather, in the, in the case of the man with gathering the sticks, perhaps this is a situation that mercy was not accepted. And it's mercy is the same idea as forgiveness. Forgiveness is both given and received. Okay, we've talked about that many times. I put the link here for the definition in our glossary about the word forgiveness. And remember, there's different words for forgive, forgiveness granted and forgiveness received. For example, in the in the Greek, forgiveness granted is uh, charizomai, is the Greek word, and forgiveness received is aphiomai, that's the Greek word. So where in 1 John it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, that forgive is forgiveness received. It's conditional on the repentance. And God granting forgiveness is unconditional. Okay, very important concept. And these um, books that we're having printed uh, in Kenya, the majority of them actually are this uh, study, little booklet on biblical forgiveness which has, has blessed a lot of people because when you realize that God forgives every sin, it really helps to take away that load of guilt and shame and <laughs> that people experience because they feel unforgiven because God does forgive. Okay, so now here is a verse which indicates that even in the case of a presumptuous sin, the sinner was to be interceded with by the priest. So, Paulette, if you can read there, Deuteronomy 17, 12, please. And the man that will do arrogantly and will not listen to the Kohen that stands to attend there before Yehovah your Elohim, or to the Sophet, even that man shall die, and you shall put away the evil from Israel. Okay, so uh, the word instead of presumptuously there you had, what was it? Arrogantly, I think. Arrogantly, yeah. Okay, that's a good word. That's kind of similar. So according to this verse, surely the priest should have included, should have talked to this person and included a plea to repent. Yeah, because it says he will not hearken unto the priest. So if the priest is saying, repent, <laughs> repent, yeah. he's not listening to him. So the presumptuousness, if that's a word, is not just, in this case, gathering sticks, but it's also not hearkening to the priest. It's, it's continuing arrogant, stubborn presumptuousness, maybe. So the priest, that would be the role of a priest, wouldn't it? To try to reconcile a person with God, to mm -hmm. plead with them to repent. So that should have happened in the case of this man. Yet it says, that soul shall be utterly cut off. That man shall surely die. These are from different verses, but he died without mercy. Uh, Numbers 15, 36, it talks about stoned him with stones and he died. So what do we do? We seem to have a contradiction here. Okay. Um, God is ever merciful. Yeah, we've we've kind of come up with a contradiction. So my suggested solution in this case, and it applies to many things in the Old Testament especially, <clears throat> is to look through the Jesus lens, we could say. Um, and I've got a little diagram here. Michael, you can't see it, but you've seen it before. I've got a little fella here looking at the Old Testament and understanding killing, wrath, and revenge, and is looking at the Old Testament through kind of the standard understanding of God's character, of the Old Testament, of law, and punishment for law, and he sees, or he understands a certain way of how God operates. And that is what we can call the letter of the law. And then below that, I had the same fellow looking at the Old Testament through the lens, we could say, of Yeshua's revelation of the character of God in the New Testament. And what he has seen there now is that God allows consequences to happen rather than imposing punishment. He sees accommodation of man's will. He sees that God 
honors the free will of man at all times. Okay, God does not force our will. He very much respects it. Okay, so let's read some more verses here. Leviticus 2010. Uh, Thomas, please. And the man that committeth adultery <clears throat> with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Okay, thank you. That sounds pretty certain, and that, of course, would apply directly to David, King David's case. But we know he was not put to death. So we're going to have to work some more to sort this out here. Okay, so then we want uh, Dorothy, John 8, verses 3 to 4, and then 11, which is all on the screen there. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Okay, so where she said, No man, Lord, that's in reply to Yeshua asking her, Has no man condemned thee? <clears throat> and he did not condemn her, even though she, she was she taught was in the very that. act of adultery. Okay. So one could argue that Jesus did say, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And he did. But whatever that meant, there was something very different between these two situations. Or between, well, of course, even David was given mercy, but a difference between David and this woman's situation and the commandment, you know, surely put to death. So it very much depends on your understanding of the law and its purpose. And I've got a series of little questions here. Is the law imposed or consequential? consequential. Is the law arbitrary or natural? <laughs> Is it retributive or restorative? Is it meant to condemn or to diagnose? Is it self-serving or other-serving? Is it for control or for blessing? Okay, any thoughts about those? All oh, the latter ones. Diagnosis. Sorry, Michael, what was that? Yeah, all the latter ones. Okay, all the ones you would choose. Yeah. Okay. So God does not impose laws because all his laws are made for our benefit not his okay god is love he is seeking more the welfare of others than his own and by consequential we just mean that you know if you cheat on your wife there's going to be consequences you might get beat up or something <laughs> okay um god's laws are are never arbitrary god is not sitting up there thinking okay what law should I make and what penalty should I put on it? Anything God says is a sin, he says is a sin because it hurts people. And mm -hmm. if it hurts people, that's the consequence, right? Mm -hmm. God is a God of love. He doesn't enforce laws in order to exact retribution. He's not petty in that way. He's always trying to restore us, to heal and restore. His law is not meant to condemn and we're going to look at this now some more. His law is meant to diagnose. The law is to show us what our problem is. You've heard perhaps the law likened to a mirror. Okay, you look in the mirror and you see, you know, your hair needs fixing or something. It diagnoses you, but it doesn't fix you. Okay, you have to do something yourself. Okay, et cetera there. So now we're going to <clears throat> look at a portion of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I've got it here in the King James Version, and beside it, and we're going to look at a number of verses as we go, beside it, beside it I have the same verses from the Remedy New Testament. 
which is a highly recommended version. It's actually a paraphrase, yes. <clears throat> and we're going to do this to help us understand the law. And then we can apply that to what we learn in the Old Testament. So what I'll do here is I'll read on the right, I have the Remedy New Testament version of 2 Corinthians 3, 6. And as I read it, you can look at the King James version of that verse on the left. And hopefully this will help to make it more clear because the King James wording often is not really clear. Okay, so for verse 6, it says, He hath made us competent members of his spiritual health care team to distribute his remedy not merely the diagnostic tool of the law, but the healing power of the spirit. For the law diagnoses us as terminal, but the spirit restores us to life. So I've just highlighted a few words here too, and you can see the diagnostic tool of the law is what the remedy says for the letter, as in the letter of the law. Okay? And then in the King James, it says, the letter killeth, and in the remedy, it says, for the law or the letter diagnoses us as terminal. Okay. The law doesn't kill anyone. We know that. But it is meant to show us or diagnose to us what our problem is. So is that reasonable to call the letter, as in the letter of the law, a diagnostic tool? You think? Yeah, you read it and you... It points out where you've gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, Paul? No, I was agreeing. Okay, good. Um, okay, now let's read before we go on to more of Second Corinthians three. Um let's and okay. where are we here? Michael, just so you're ready, your next verse will be Romans five. 20. But first of all, Evans, if you could read Romans 7 7, please. Okay, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God for, forbid. Nay, I, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known plastic. Except the, the law has said, thou shall not con confide. Okay, this is a, a good verse, actually, for demonstrating that the law is a diagnostic tool. Now, why do I say that? Because <clears throat> it says I hadn't not known sin, but by the law. If I hadn't, I wouldn't know what sin was if I didn't see the law. Okay, good. Yeah, it's perfect one for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another good one is uh, Michael Romans five twenty, please. Romans five twenty, one of Adrian's famous ones. Lately, moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay, now I've switched the order with Judy because I'm going to have her read from the screen here. Romans five twenty in. Now, this is actually, it just says expanded paraphrase. This is mine, okay? I just added some words to hopefully make it more clear. So go ahead. Version according to Ray. <clears throat> Moreover, the law entered as a diagnostic tool that we might realize our sinfulness. But as we became more aware of our state of sinfulness, our feeling of need for grace became greater. Okay. So can you see there... Um, in, in place of that, the offense might abound. Like, we could question that. What does that mean? Like, more sin? That's not good. Where did it ab abound? It's that we would realize our sinfulness. It's abounding in our mind in the sense that we're coming to understand that we have a problem, that we're sinful. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and then it says, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So I put uh, we became more aware of our state of sinfulness and our feeling of need for grace became later, mm -hmm. greater. And of course, we would then receive more grace. Okay, so now we're going to look at verse 7 and 9, just touch on them quickly of uh, 2 Corinthians 3. 
it says in the King James, but the if the ministration of death, and I won't even read the whole verses in this case, and the remedy says, <clears throat> if the agency that diagnosed mankind was terminal, okay, ministration of death, an agency that diagnoses as terminal. And then verse 9, it says, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, and in the remedy, it says, if the agency that diagnoses people as terminal. So in the King James, it's ministers death, which is not very clear, but it's really pointing out <clears throat> that the sinner is on the road to eternal death. And in the remedy, it's kind of more clear that it's it's a warning that's diagnosing that we're eternal if we continue that way. So what is the agency that diagnoses us as terminal? The law. It's oh, the yeah. law, exactly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's not that God condemns so much as it is pointing out our danger. Okay. Okay, now let's have uh, Romans 7, 9, uh, Paul. 7, 9. For I was alive without the Torah once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Okay, so we had Paulette read that. We got a Paul and a Paulette here. <laughs> okay. Sorry? <so. clears throat> um, Okay, so when it says sin revived, it's really talking like he became aware of his sinful condition would be a good way to put it. Okay, I don't think it means that he was alive and when, when he came to understand the law, he started sinning more. I don't think it's saying that. He became aware of his sinful condition. So now let's read um, Paul. Can you see that on your little screen to yeah. read from the remedy? Yeah. Once I thought <clears throat> I was healthy and free from the infection of distrust, fear, and selfishness, but then the commandment examined me, exposed how utterly infected I was, and diagnosed me as terminal. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So that's again from the remedy. So again, what the law did was to expose how utterly infected he was. It was to show that he was a sinner. Okay, it's a diagnosis. The I died, as it is given in the King James up here in Romans 7, 9. The I died is no more literal than various equivalent terms like surely die, etc. in the Old Testament. Okay. Well, it's it's the, the the death of the old man. That's what's happening there with Paul. Right. It's a he's spiritual. dying, not the law. <clears throat> right, but it's a spiritual death. Yes. The point I'm making is it's not talking about a physical death. Okay. So we can easily accept that what Paul said is figurative. And yet, be most people will think 100% certain that statements in the Old Testament are literal. Most will, yes. Yeah, but we can see the connection between them. They're both kind of saying the same thing. But we'll look at this more after we take a break here. We're going to take a break for 10 minutes. Um, we probably got some things to do in the kitchen and whatnot. So let's take a break for 10 minutes. Um, we will. Return. <clears throat> 